Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Um, uh, Burton. Um, could you give us a little bit of an overview of who you are, um, where you work, where you live? Uh, I'm John Burton. I am uh, uh, living in a small town of Blacksburg, Virginia. I am at Virginia Tech, where I've been for the last 35 years. Uh, came basically directly here out of, out of my Ph.D. program. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about how you got interested in this field? It was uh, pretty much by accident. I, although I had published a couple of pieces, uh, one with Paul Merrill on uh, uh, needs assessment when I was a grad student, and shortly thereafter I got to Virginia Tech, I worked with uh, Terry Wildman on a piece with learning theory and design. Uh, in which, by the way, we use the phrase uh, the new cognitive psychology, so that goes back to the late 70s, I guess. But I really didn't have an interest or background in it uh, uh, at all until at Virginia Tech I had come as an educational psychologist uh, and been told by the dean at that time that educational psychology was not going to ever be, was not going to take over his college, was not going to be a player, would never have a doctoral degree, so on and so forth. And I hooked up with a friend of mine here, uh, Mike Moore. Uh, Mike had a media program that did have a PhD. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the, the, the few souls in Ed Psych and the few souls in media joined up together, and, and uh, uh, I got involved in the existing PhD at the time, which was technology, media, what have you. Could you talk a little bit about the primary focus of your work, of your research? In recent years, it's, it's, I've been involved mostly with uh, again with the notion of theory in, in, uh, in design and, and probably uh, the last bastion of, uh, of behaviorism in, in, the, in the world until it gets reborn. Uh, and I think as you get older you become more of a counterpuncher. So I, I, I follow a lot what my students and colleagues are doing. I work with them and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, probably don't lead them as much as I did as a as a youngster. So it, it, it pops if you take a look at the publications. Could you talk a little bit about how you became interested in behaviorism or even other specific areas of your research? My background is in psychology. All mm -hmm. of it. So at the time I was growing up, behaviorism was, was really the primary theory that and Hall Spence mm -hmm. was still being taught. Cognitive psychology came in. Actually the first book in cognitive psychology was when I was a master's student, I mean, it, it was it was hot, and, and I studied a lot of that when I was at, at uh, uh, Nebraska, just because people were teaching seminars and trying to get into the latest and greatest thing. Uh, as I I taught a, a, a seminar with Jim Garrison years ago. Jim Garrison is our our philosopher, and he's a Deweyan, maybe one of the leading Deweyan scholars, and. Dewey had what he called a, 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 a sophisticated view of behaviorism, and my view of, of behaviorism off, off camera was always a naive view of behaviorism. We taught a course in cognitive psychology together, cognitive science. It was still, again, fairly new. Um, went, in, went in really as believers, I think, in, in, in cognitive science, and I sort of became uh, the devil's advocate and, and, and argued the other side. And by the time it was over, we were both we were both behaviorists again. Okay. So. <laughs> so you circled back. That's correct. Okay. Could you speak a little bit more about how you've experienced these transitions and new learning theories? So you sort of begin with behaviorism, and you spoke just a moment ago a little bit about cognitivism coming on board. And then could you say something um, even about constructivism? How sure. you, how you experience these transitions? Sure. Um, Again, when I was coming up, the, mm -hmm. the notion of a grand theory, of a, of, a, of a learning theory that fit everything was, was, uh, was the goal. And, and actually, I took a course in theory building, and I took a whole course in Hull Spence. I took, you know, uh, theory tended to be much more important in, in those days. Uh, when we got into cognitive psychology, uh, at least initially, it was it was a loosely bound information processing thing made up mm -hmm. of sort of many hypotheses. It was more it was more 
uh, pieces and parts that were tested rather than anything that fit together in any sort of holistic way. Uh, that evolved over time, but it's, st it's still very, uh, y y people can plug pieces in and out and, and, uh, and what have you. When cognitive psychology, or I'm sorry, when constructivism uh, first hit the scene, my first reaction was, yeah, all right, that's, that's all true, we knew that. I didn't really realize that, that so many people didn't think that that meaning was constructed, that perception and, 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 and uh, uh, memory was constructed. Uh, and, but as soon as I did, I, you know, I can remember saying to my colleagues, well, this is great, we're going to be all behaviorists soon, we're all coming back. This, is, this notion of, of interaction and whatever is what behaviorism is all about, uh, at least uh, uh, anything after 1940 or whatever. Uh -huh. um, it didn't work. Out. It didn't work out that way, as you know. So, so that's when I when I probably became more when I began to push back more with uh, probably where cognitivism was sort of a loose collection of, of theoretical notions. Constructivism was none of that. It was more of a of a philosophy or pedagogy mm -hmm. or or, or I don't know, orientation uh, uh, with that at, at its center the notion that. Uh, uh, there is people can look at the same thing and and and, and see different meaning and, and as I said we knew that since in psychology at least since the 1880s and I would guess in philosophy could you describe your research in interest when you started your career and then maybe talk about how those change as your career developed right I spent the first well, 15 years of my career studying basic memorial processes, mm -hmm. small level cognitive stuff, and then as a result of a colleague I began working with here, now retired, Jerry Niles, uh, uh, who was a reading guy, I, you know, I began to, to tie up some of what I knew about memory and paradigms that were, that you could research uh, basic memorial processes with reading. All right, so we began to look at, at uh, 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 how different, how levels of processing, for example, was actually it's kind of big again, I guess, in, in some iteration. But the notion that people process things more deeply, and 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 in reading you could do manipulations. I was coming out of something called mathematics, and and you know you could add questions or boldface or how figures worked or or something that would cause it to be more more memorable. Um, but in my career, I, once once I got started in basic memory, even when I began to move into our area, I wanted to make full professor, and I, I didn't want to lose that line. So I, I stayed into I stayed in memory for a, a, a five eight years after I wanted to do it. To be honest with you, I, I was I was ready to do something else. Uh, but if you take a look at that at that point, uh, at, at that point after 15 years or so of my career, I began to I, I left that work and never did it again. Uh, um, interestingly, I never saw how it could relate to what what we do. I, I uh, uh, as as I look at what goes on now with uh, uh, cognitive loads and and whatever. 15, 20 years after we were talking about cognitive loads. Mm -hmm. If I had if I had enough sense, I said, "Well, yeah, that that relates. We could do that." Uh, but I didn't have enough sense, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. And, and, and in all fairness, I didn't know anything about our area, really. I, mm -hmm. You know, I, I was just flying by the seat of my pants. Okay. Maybe I can ask you a little bit about how maybe some of your early experiences, maybe even earlier jobs, influenced choices and and. Um, arguments you may have been thinking about as you moved along in your career? Well, as I say, I did have a taste for mm -hmm. for uh, instructional design and technology in a couple of ways. One, I, I had I'd gone to work after, uh, at the end of my doctoral program and for, for a little while afterwards with a, an outfit called uh, uh, University of Mid-America. And University of Mid-America was a big project, uh, eight, ten university consortium to develop materials to be delivered at a distance to our mm -hmm. 
target audience, a 33-year-old wo uh, woman in, with two kids in Cozad, Nebraska. So we were trying to we were trying to put together stuff that could be delivered by newspaper and TV and what have you. I was on the fringe of that because I was actually working on the on the evaluation side. That was mm -hmm. much closer to my strength. I, I was aware of of uh, the designers and what they were doing. Um, Tiagi was out there. Gary Moore, Morrison was out there. Uh, uh, Fran Aversa was out there. Bo Valance was out there. We we had a bunch of people that eventually became names in in uh, uh, design and or evaluation. So that gave me sort of a taste, but as I say, I, I was, my whole career, you know, a bachelor's in, in, in uh, uh, psychology, and I, I did a master's degree at Illinois State in psychology, experimental, and then I, I went into uh, uh, educational psychology at Nebraska. Uh, all, the only other job I really took at, at a college university level was, was at Southwest Missouri State after I finished my master's. And really, I just wanted to see whether I wanted to hang around academics, whether I really wanted to mm -hmm. do that. And my job was teaching only. I hadn't really thought, I hadn't even thought about doing research. I, I, uh, I went down there and taught for a couple years, taught psychology courses, uh, introductory psych courses, and adjustment and things like that. So, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where I was going to go with all this, but, <laughs> but that, as I say, then I came here for 35 years, and it was, yeah. really was a matter of, the colleagues that I was working with. When I was working with Jerry Niles and Terry Wallman, we did a lot of work uh, 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 with reading and with Niles, with, with uh, Wallman. He was very much a, a, an ap applied kind of uh, 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 Ed Sight kind of guy, uh, uh, although we argued the opposite when we were talking about mm -hmm. introductions. Introductions, he would argue more theory, and I would argue teach these kids what to do when they get out into the yeah. schools or whatever. Uh, but that sort of got I me, mean, and then and then I had I had some very good students early on, and they 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 sort of shape your career, to be honest with you. So, could you um, speak to some of the important trends and ID that you saw throughout your career, and then maybe also follow up with where you see ID going in the future? Okay. I, I think in, in the beginning, when I first became aware of design and thought much about it, uh, we were very much coming out of the programmed instruction era, still in it mm -hmm. to some extent. I had studied in graduate school the early computerized system, Ticket and Planet and Plato and whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, but at that time it was really kind of about you tell me what you want your people to learn and you tell me how much money I have and I'll, I'll get them there. Uh, so outcome, the idea that we could predict an outcome, pretty much guarantee it, uh, was in, was central to what to what design was about at that time. Um, trends, you know, there was there was some social trends that happened. For one thing, it was an all male uh, 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 bastion. The first the first conference I went to, uh, an informal conference, PIDT, maybe 120 people, and one of them was a woman. I mean, you just didn't see that now. Now the balance has shifted, so it's, it's, it's probably a, a majority may be women at this point, but certainly it's not not the way it was. Uh, it also shifted in terms of, of um, in the beginning, everything was quantitative. Everything was, was uh, a, in a best of all worlds, experimental. Qualitative began to work its way in. We had, uh, uh, Guba was here uh, uh, as a visiting scholar for, for a year and, and uh, uh, began to introduce the whole notion of, of, uh, of qualitative data as an evaluator. And as an evaluator, it always used, evaluate, uh, used qualitative data, but it never occurred to me to try to do that as, as a researcher. And, and that, that trend sort of, sort of changed where we we're going, the kind of questions we were going to ask. Um, the rise of cognitive theory, of course, but then constructivism probably any any sort of last notion that we're going to predict outcomes got uh, watered down even further when we got to constructivism. Uh, outcomes became a little bit more of a moving target because you were rather than rather than accepting as I would that there's always variation. This time we were actually going to try to do it, you know. And I've mm -hmm. I've tried to work with students where you say, okay, tell me how you would keep people from constructing. What 
what repressive things could you do to keep these people from constructing? And it's, it's very hard to come up with an environment like that okay. uh, that wouldn't put you in jail before it's all over. Um, recent trends probably, we, we moved, the, when I came in and, and uh, um, uh, uh, cognitive psychology was beginning to catch on. Theory was it was not really terribly powerful in the area. It was more of a create models sort of an area. Mm -hmm. There was lots and lots of models, and everybody was sort of producing them. Uh, that's that shifted. Theory has become more important, and and one of the things that's done is tighten us back up with psychology. So at our university and at many, you see people. Uh, either evolving um, or devolving, depending on who you're talking to, into, le into the learning sciences and, and mm -hmm. a, more, a more psyche approach to the way we do business and a more psych central approach to mm -hmm. how, how, how people learn. And that's, that's also a big shift in education generally from teaching to learning and the learning. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the people that have really influenced your growth? Um, as a scholar, and how they may have, and, and, and how they've directed your um, your thinking and your scholarship, whether it's colleagues or even students. You know, professionally, the, the people that I, I you know, I met David Johnson thirty some years ago, uh, and and we had, we were friends for uh, for that period of time. Uh, he. I wouldn't say we influence each other very terribly much. So, uh, but actually, David, uh, uh, some of David's work uh, uh, later in problem solving was similar to some stuff that I had done uh, uh, a few years before that with Dr. With Sue Magliera, who was was our director. Here. Sue was one of my students, so she had an influence, and and that her her uh, dissertation took me into that area. Uh, Colleagues here, guys like Mike Moore, uh, 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 Jerry Niles, like I said, and Reed, Terry Wildman, uh, and it's like they had a great, great influence on me. Uh, current guys that I pay attention to I, are still old guys. I mean, they're still, mm -hmm. Mike Hannafin and I, 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 uh, I think a lot of his work and what he does, and, and uh, uh, both as a person and as a, as a, as a scholar. Uh, as I say, my whole, as I've gotten older, my whole, I don't know if you could just get more often as you get older, but, but my whole approach has been more to push back and counterpunch against the, mm -hmm. against the prevailing theory or whatever, and I, and I've, I, I do better working with, uh, I thought I turned it off, I, I do better, uh, 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 with students I tend to follow them, I, I tend to get into what they're doing more than mm -hmm. impose what I'm doing on them. Right. That makes sense. But, Obviously, some of the great students here, uh, Mike Ori and Branch at, at uh, 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 Georgia, Barbara Lockie is, is one of ours. And we, we, had, we had a lot of good students who always leave a mark, uh, mm -hmm. always leave a mark. What would you say is the greatest accomplishment in your career? Probably the best thing I've done with my students. I, I've, enjoyed all, I've enjoyed that more than anything else in my career. Um, to see them succeed is is, uh, is is always a very very good feeling, and I I, I was really blessed with uh, uh, great great colleagues. I've had I've always had good good colleagues to work with, and, and you know as people students leave and they look look at things that are important. Uh, you know what is this? What are the benefits like at this job? Or you know mm -hmm. what you know, what. Uh, what kind of work do they do, or so on and so forth? I, I, if you can find the right place to be, and you got good people, uh, the rest will sort of take care of itself. So. Okay. How would you like to be remembered in the profession? <laughs> uh, if if I am remembered, <laughs> I you know I have a couple pieces on the on the board now, again in behaviorism, but I I guess I'd like to be remembered as I told you so. You know, as, <laughs> As we begin to look at the mechanisms that really make sense under constructivism, uh, uh, if that survives as an orientation, or we take a look at badgeification and competency-based education, and some of the things that are just shiny and new and spiffy now, but are are all 
grounded in the other B word. Uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, yeah, as again, I like to be the one when, when people look back to say, oh, that guy told us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, then here's my off book follow up to that. Okay. So, um, do you think behaviorism will rise again? And if so, what would it look like uh, in, in the latest iteration? And by, you know, will it be accepted? Will people. I think it can rise again. I, I think it, ta it, it will take a, an extreme shift. Uh, it's a very egoless point of view. It, it's uh, we have awareness uh, and and we have trouble believing that it all follows a certain mechanism that's fairly basic from. Plenary at a people or whatever that that uh, 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 they all respond to the same rules, so we get to a point in the in the evolutionary scale where like I say, oh, there's a lot, of, there's so much going on in there that's got to be important. Um, somebody once said, if you make something an animal that's self-aware, you know, you probably ought to make them delusional because if they you know, they, would, they would have this this existential crisis if they really thought about. <laughs> What controls their life? Uh, uh, I, uh, I, th I think it's being done now in many, mm -hmm. in many respects, and, and people, and I, I, all right, it's situated cognition. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, but isn't that the same as a stimulus context, or, or you know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, interaction. All right. Well, isn't that isn't that a social uh, 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 give and take of of, uh, of response and, and feedback and I, I think what's, what holds it back now is that people have this, this real doggy notion of what uh, 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 behaviorism is. They think of Pavlov and, and, and classical conditioning and, and uh, uh, the stuff done in the, in the 20s or whatever, in 20s and 30s. And, uh, if you look at, at the, at the radi so-called radical behaviorism or selectivist behaviorism from Skinner in the Again, running from about the 40s, it's not like that at all. It's more like evolution. It, the behaviorists mm -hmm. are, are selected because they work. Uh, you know, they, uh, it's, it's not so much a matter of the giraffe's going to grow a longer neck because that's where the leaves are, but if, if growing a longer neck allows you to get to the leaves over time, that's going to happen. Well, uh, it's... If, if people are taught behaviors that are successful in the environment that they are uh, uh, in at the time, uh, they'll learn. Right? And it doesn't, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me that what you, whether you call it a negotiation or a, or a free operant interchange or whatever. There's, there's, people are trying to, trying to succeed in that conversation. Uh, they, they want it to. They want it to keep going, and they want it generally. Uh, mm -hmm. And if they don't, they, they have mechanisms for trying to shut it down. But they generally want to keep it going, and, they, and they're in a teaching learning situation. You're trying to shape the other guy around. At some point, you're going to say, "Oh hell no, that's not constructivism. That's you know, you'll, you'll if not punish, you'll at least withdraw anything that's at all reinforcing and make them uh, uh, come around to your point of view. Uh, that won't be different." You know, I agree. All right. Okay. Well, I have one last question to ask you. Okay. Is there something that a story you would like to tell, or something you'd like to say <laughs> <laughs> that I haven't been able to ask you, or that you just want to have on the record? No, I really. You don't want to I, say I told you so one last time. <laughs> well, I, you know, should I survive to that point? I really would. Like to, and uh, you know, I, I mentioned Dave, uh, Dave uh, uh, Johnson. He. He did me a big favor when he was put together that first handbook, and he gave me a platform to to write probably the the, the best the best piece, the big the best thinking I've done about behaviorism in a very very long time. Uh, and that that piece, uh, although they don't use that stuff anymore, uh, uh, we have more of a a pop view of of, uh, of behaviorism because people don't read it anymore. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, it's kind of like the game where people whisper to each other to get around the circle, and, and the notion of what behaviorism is is very distorted when it comes around. Uh, 
that piece gave me a chance to, to, to say what I knew about behaviorism and, and uh, uh, I'm very grateful to him for that and, and was at the time.